Welcome everybody to the latest installment of 19V. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker, Kate Antonova from Queens College, CUNY. The title of her talk is Masculinizing the Russian Elite, Metropolitan Filariet's Purge of Early 19th Century Society. Also very happy to introduce our subsidiary, Marta Lukashevich from the University of Warsaw. So Kate, take it away. Uh, okay, thank you so much for having me. This is really exciting and it's lovely to see all of you. I want to apologize for a few people who saw this years ago now, saw some parts of this at an ACES conference. I promise there's new content in the last third that is from my 2019 trip to Petersburg where I went to Erdia and found tons more. So, so <laughs> the suspense is going to kill you, but you're going to get there at the end. There's some exciting new stuff there. Um, and for those of you who, who weren't there for the ACS paper, uh, you'll, you'll get the background that comes before this. Um, so this is a paper that I'm preparing for a kind of spinoff article, but it's a spinoff of a book project. So just really quickly, the larger book project. Um, actually, I have a terrible time explaining it quickly. <laughs> so I'm trying to be quick. This has been an issue. Um, but the larger book project is about the policing of several women mystics, and it's about the women in particular, which is why the guy I'm talking about today, Dubovitsky, is kind of a, a spinoff project that I'm doing an article on. Um, uh, so you'll see mention of those women and so on in the larger argument, but the, the book itself actually focuses on the women, but it's about the policing of these women by the third section, because it started with this framing. Initially, I was thinking about looking at them in different ways, but um, with, uh, gosh, it's probably close to 10 years ago now when I was in um, Garf in Moscow and trying to kill time while my husband, Sergei, who is unfortunately not here right now because he's getting his booster shot, um, but he was uh, being slow as usual and I was done at Garf. And so I just was randomly going through the third section archives just to browse because they're interesting. And I was already interested in these particular women, including Ekaterina Tatarineva, who is a mystic. I just looked up names of people I was interested in. So I looked her up and there was a thousand pages in the third section on her. And at that point, what I knew is she was arrested when all the secret societies were wound up after 1825. She was arrested and put in a monastery. She had run a secret society. It seemed straightforward. So what on earth could the third section have a thousand pages to say about that? So the, the paper that I then did at AC some years after that was, was based on those thousand pages. And then in 2019, I was able to spend this year in Petersburg and go to Ergia, where I found, um, I thought I was just going to look at the sort of synod version of the, of the same case. I found countless thousands of pages. It turned out not only was the third section paying a lot of attention, not only was the synod paying a lot of attention, the Ministry of Finance was deeply interested in this case as well. And it went far beyond to Karnava. So I'm going to explain this as we go. I have not sorted it all out yet. There's many thousands of pages I ended up having to spend uh, my children's future inheritance on copies. <laughs> um, and so I've got tons of stuff I have not even gone through yet. I've only sort of seen what's there, not, not read all of it. So I'm focusing right now on this Dubovitsky thing. So I could just read that stuff. And that's how far I've gotten. So I kind of have a sense of what else was out there, but haven't gotten all of it yet. That's still years away, really. Um, so anyway, Dubovitsky. Alexander Petrovich Dubovitsky. Let me now share my screen so you can see a picture of him. The um, slideshow is really just kind of to give us all something to stare at besides the Zoom boxes, <laughs> because that's just so painful. Um, they're really just portraits as visual aids. So this is a young Dubovitsky before he got into trouble. The interesting thing about actually this painting is it was painted by Borovikovsky, who was a follower of Tatarinova. He was a member of Katerina Tatarnova's mystical circle uh, in the 1820s. Um, and one of his most famous paintings is this one, The Appearance of Christ to Ekaterina Filipovna Tatarnova. So that's a close up of her there. Um, so Borovyakovsky was, was certainly a follower um, and had an illustrious career as a uh, portrait painter, especially. Um, Dubovitsky was accused of being a follower of Tatarnova. He was under investigation by the third section, even actually started before there was a third section, it begins in 1824. He's initially arrested under orders by Arakcheyev, continues all the way until his death in 1848. He was accused of following Tatarnova. He was accused of being a Skopjets, and Tatarnova was often confused with or, or officials worried about her being um, associated with the Skopsi. Um, he was also, though, accused of being a Mason, which is totally contradictory and very unlikely that the same person would be doing both. 
As it turns out, uh, I see no evidence that he was any of these things. In fact, there's no evidence that he did anything wrong his entire life, even though uh, by the time he starts getting in trouble uh, with the first arrest in 1824 until 1848, he's only free for a few years and he's under constant surveillance that entire time. Um, so I wanted to figure out what was going on with this um, as a way of getting into why this investigation with the part of a is in such incredible scale and involving multiple parts of, of government and state. Um, so Dubovitsky was the son of a Rizan landowner who actually came from very obscure origins and, and a, somehow made a fortune. It's unclear how he did this. So Dubovitsky as a young man, as you see in the portrait here, was put into the Preobrazhensky regiment off for an illustrious future until he was charged with stealing funds that he had been entrusted to transport for the regiment. He claimed it was an accident that they were lost in transit, which of course is entirely possible, but he was thrown out of the regiment. Um, it may be that this one incident, which accident or not, we have no way of knowing, uh, sort of created the, the where there's smoke, there's fire uh, with his file. But in any case, that was as a young man. It's only when he's 42 in 18, 1824 when the problems really begin. So this part, we're gonna go over the series of, of problems in Dubovitsky's life that cause all this surveillance and the investigations. I subtitled this part, a series of unfortunate events. This poor guy had a, had a really sad life. So 1824, he's first arrested and will spend two years in a monastery for the charge of, quote, spreading harmful teachings about faith among the peasants. He was accused in Rizan, where he was residing at his provincial estate, his father's estate. He was accused of uh, telling peasants that all people are equal in 1824, Adak Cheyev orders the arrest. So it sounds, it's a specifically religious charge that, that he's spreading heresy, um, but he's, he's charged by Adak Cheyev with saying peasants are equal to, to others. Um, however, he was accused by the local horse trader of all people, as well as a local priest. And Dubovitsky himself said he was actually handing out Bibles for the local Bible society. And the Bible society in 1824 was about to go down to, to political controversy, but had been a popular and completely innoc innocuous organization started by uh, A.N. Galitsyn, Alexander Nikolaevich Galitsyn, who was the Minister of Education. It was, there were many European Bible societies. They simply translated Bibles into all of the vernacular languages of the Russian empire and handed them out. However, it eventually goes down under charges of being a little too Protestant of, of handing out vernacular Bibles, right? Um, so he was apparently handing, he openly admitted to handing out Bibles for the Bible Society, but at this point, that was not something you could be charged with. Uh, and Dubovitsky himself said it was the local horse trader had a beef with his family. Um, and so that that caused the accusation and, and Arak Cheyev was, was simply over aggressive about it. So he ends up in a monastery for two years and now has this on his record. Um, he was defended and eventually given permission to leave after the two years by uh, the Metropolitan of St. Petersburg, Serafim Glagolevsky. Then a year later, this is actually while he's still in the monastery, after a year of, of uh, confinement in the monastery, he was accused again by totally unrelated people, the family of a merchant wife named Schrader. We know nothing about her, but the family accuses Dubovitsky of spreading bad uh, bad religious ideas to her as well, and specifically encouraging her to leave her husband and encouraging her, uh, I think it was her sister or her friend, her sister, to leave a planned marriage, to run away from the marriage. Uh, this was associated with the Skopzi, who were seen as being anti-marriage um, and breaking up families. Uh, but also in the file, they accused Schrader of being associated with Dubovitsky and that he, he was the one who encouraged her to leave, but also Gosner, the preacher, Johannes Gosner. So let me go forward a little bit so you can see him. Um, he often comes up in these files in the 1820s as, as a person of interest. The authorities were, you know, concerned. And here's where, again, we see um, a hint of Protestantism, not mentioned, but possibly part of the issue. And I'm very excited, therefore, about Andrei Ivanov's new book. It just won the 18th century prize. Um, that is you know, uh, Russia's Reformation, Russia's toying with Reformation on the same period. So I'm looking forward to that. I've heard him speak about it and that has definitely influenced um, what I'm gonna argue here. But in any case, um, so Dubovitsky's version of the story is that he's in a monastery, right? Uh, officially forced into a monastery. This Madame Schrader, who he doesn't know, and her sister 
come to him because he was recommended to them as a holy man, as a person of strong religious conviction. These two women told him that the, the husband of the first and the fiance of the second were abusive and they wanted to leave. He says, you have to leave that up to God. So he argued that he didn't even encourage them to leave, but they ultimately did leave the, the husband and fiance. Um, he said he knew nothing about Gosner, knew nothing about anything else, completely innocent. Okay, so he gets out a year later uh, under the recommendation of Seraphim. 1829, so he's only been out for three years. He is again accused um, and he is under surveillance as soon as he's let out of the monastery. So the third section has uh, denunciations that they receive, apparently just you know, people randomly sending them letters, but they also send deliberate informants to watch him and to record what he says and send it back to the third section. So these thousand pages, a lot of it's about Tatarnova and others, but the, of the thousand pages, there's quite a bit on Dubovitsky and it, it consists of a lot of these letters by informants or uh, denunciations. Um, so he's not accused of anything the third section worries about until this next issue in 1829, which is when Dubovitsky went to the, a village uh, an unnamed village where he was courting a lady for a second marriage. And apparently he was there with some guy named Arpomon, who while he was there in the guise of a holy fool, raped two peasant girls. Dubovitsky is then charged with associating with this Arpomon person. Um, the lady refuses his suit at this point. So he loses the prospect of a second wife. Uh, he argues that he had nothing to do with Arpomon, didn't even know the guy, just happened to be there at the same time. Artemon is, is uh, caught and charged. Dubovitsky remains under surveillance. Um, so they don't really do anything about this point, but his file keeps getting thicker and thicker. Next year, 1830, uh, the gendarmes are tipped off by a, a random voluntary uh, anonymous denouncer that Dubovitsky was running a school from his home and that he was teaching wrong ideas at the school. And when he was released from the monastery after the first two year sentence, he had to sign a pledge saying he would never teach uh, anything in contradiction to, to the Orthodox faith. Um, so that he was teaching that there was a school at all, at least theoretically contradicted the terms under which he was released. And then of course, it's a separate question whether he was teaching anything quote unquote wrong. Um, so in the investigation, he does admit to teaching students. And in fact, one of the students uh, who was put into his care was the son of uh, Archimandrit Platon, um, who apparently trusted him completely. Uh, it was also uh, his own, one of his own children and then the, a few neighbors' children. So Dubovitsky's defense was that it didn't constitute a school. It was just a handful of children um, and that he wasn't teaching them anything wrong. So because there were students and parents involved, they, they basically interrogated everyone. Uh, mostly by letter, but uh, they asked everyone what was going on. And it turns out, uh, although Dubovitsky admitted to admiring Lancastrian schools, he said he was not following any such methods. The only thing any of the students, parents, or Dubovitsky himself uh, described in his teachings were that he was putting extensive, extensive time and care, and this is really documented, into preventing the students from masturbating. That seems to have been his primary concern. Uh, and it involved monitoring them at night and locked underwear during the day. Uh, the state and church found no problem with this whatsoever. This was fine. <laughs> um, but there, were, there was nothing else to what he was doing, apparently, other, other than sort of standard uh, education for the time. Um, so again, he, he's okay until three years later, he's suddenly arrested and put into a monastery again, this time with no additional charge. So at this point, it seems to have been based on a kind of long string of curious circumstances in his file. Um, he's arrested in 1833 and then confined to the monastery for 13 years. So he remains in a monastery apart from unable to see his children for 13 years until 1846. Um, towards the end, the last couple of years, he's moved to a different monastery nearer to one of his children, um, but he's not actually released until 1846. And then two years after that, he is again, uh, under investigation, specifically for this time political sedition, not false teachings or any religious charge, but political sedition in his 1848. I assume it's not a coincidence that that was the year 1848. Um, however, he, he was, his house was searched, his servants were questioned, they find no evidence of wrongdoing, Dubovitsky says he hasn't done anything wrong, um, and in fact, the, um, the third section officer 
uh, who questioned him uh, and supported it with a letter wrote that uh, Dubovitsky was uh, completely dedicated to the sovereign emperor and to the existing order of things. He's horrified about events in the West, which makes it clear that that it was it what was inspiring the investigation. Perhaps luckily for Dubovitsky, he dies at that point. So there's no further charges. But so what we see here is uh, the initial charge, the first arrest, 1824, which is again, a significant year, uh, seems to have been political. It's at least partially political. He's accused of false teachings, false religious teachings, but um, it's that the specific false teaching that was uh, cited at that time is that he was saying peasants and others are equal. So that's political. Then there's all these sort of moral religious issues, uh, questions about his life. And then in 1848, uh, it becomes directly political again. Um, you'll notice I have not mentioned Tatarnava yet in any of these charges. None of the formal charges were about Tatarnava. However, during the investigations between 1830, which is the incident of the school, and 1833, when he's actually put in the monastery, what seems to have been the point where they decide on, on the consequences being quite severe, 13 years in a monastery, um, that's when the third section is very busily trying to investigate in the background whether he's connected to Tatarnava. And Tatarnava was also under investigation and, and then being arrested and confined to a monastery all at the same time uh, in the early 1830s, the first few years of the 1830s. Um, so once Dubovitsky is already arrested and questioned, he is questioned specifically about Tatarnava. Uh, he says, that he's known her from a young age because their families knew each other and there's nothing wrong in that. Uh, he said he never agreed with her on any religious issues. Um, and he said, in fact, as part of his defense, and this is in a letter he wrote specifically in his defense, um, that uh, others who were higher placed knew her better and were actual intimates. And he named specifically Emperor Alexander I. This was a great defense in the sense that it sure makes him seem innocent. On the other hand, it may have been what actually got him into the monastery, that he made a statement that Alexander I specifically was an actual intimate of Tatarnava, which of course everyone knew to be the case, um, but was becoming embarrassing by the time Nicholas is the czar and things have changed drastically after 1825. Um, he also enclosed, Dubovitsky enclosed a letter um, that he had written to Alexander Nikolaevich Galitsyn, the, the Minister of Enlightenment, um, that uh, he had written before the arrest. So it was evidence of his views regarding Tatarinova before he'd been questioned about her. He had specifically, and apropos of nothing in particular, written to Galitsyn that he can't become close to Tatarinova because of his own religious views. Uh, so he could document that he disagreed with her. And interestingly, he's documenting this to an incredibly much more powerful person, Alexander Nikolaevich Galitsyn. Galitsyn was not a follower of Tatarna, but was definitely sympathetic to her up until she comes under suspicion and then he kind of breaks all relations with her. Um, but they were having, until all these arrests started, Galitsyn and Dubovitsky were having a, a pleasant correspondence in which Dubovitsky was explaining, no, I, I can't really go where Tatarna goes. Um, so then the investigators, the third section investigators, um, become somewhat obsessed over many pages about the particular practice Tatarnava was known for um, called Dradenia, Dradenia, which uh, we talked about quite a bit when I did this at the ACES uh, paper, and I don't want to go into it in as much detail here, um, because as it turns out, it doesn't look like it's actually the crux of things at all. But Dradenia is a practice that no one seems to have understood. Tatarnava never used the word herself, apparently because Radenia as a word was associated with the Skopsi and Tatarnava was clear that she was not one of them. She called, she, her word for what she did was Vastorg, um, which is obviously just, just means joy. That's, that's what she said. It wasn't like a term for a specific practice. She just experienced Vastorg uh, when in this religious state. The only thing everyone agrees on that was involved in whatever this practice was is it involved songs songs that Tatarnava and her followers wrote themselves. As it turns out in the Petersburg archives, there are copious, copious amounts of the songs themselves. Um, some of them in Tatarnava's own handwriting. They read very much like Protestant hymns. Um, and I can't go into a lot of detail on that right now because I, I haven't gone through all the texts yet and I need to look at them much more closely than I have so far. But just when I was reading through them sitting in the archive, um, they are simple religious songs expressing joy in God and faith. Um, and they sound very much like the sort of things I was raised in a Protestant church in the Midwest uh, hearing and, and 
that may be an issue, right? But she was accused of much more than that. Um, she was accused by the third section in this file of doing, quote, a type of dance accompanied by this more religious song composed personally by the senior members of society. It ends by a quick twisting in place and falling down in unconsciousness with convulsions and foam at the mouth, after which the dancer pronounces to those present certain words which they are obligated to take to be inspiring. This uh, version, which it do doesn't say exactly who said this, it's just in the third section file that this is their, the definition of radinia that they're going on. Um, it's not clear who accused them of that, but no one else ever says that there was foaming at the mouth. No one who was actually in Tatarnava society, not Tatarnava herself, not any of the people who admitted openly to being her followers ever said it was anything like that. They just simply said it was songs. And Tatarnava herself said she experienced the Vastorg um, in, in singing the songs. Um, so it seems like the concern, at least in the files, was not so much the content or the fact that they were writing them, although they always make a point of mentioning that, um, but rather they saw all this kind of other performance going along with it, the, the um, maybe shaker style or, or whatever kind of performance going on with it. However, there was a response in the third section file by someone named Ivan Pavlov, and unfortunately I have no idea who this guy was. Um, if anybody has any clue or ever comes across anything, I would love to hear about it. He's described by the third section officers who wrote this down um, as, quote, a man of high spiritual life. So whether he's, he's just kind of, he's also described uh, um, in a separate page that's like a cover letter as a vagrant. So some kind of wandering holy man rescued in style, I don't know. But um, he wrote, uh, 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 I guess, a statement for the third section uh, that placed all of these accusations on Metropolitan Filaret specifically. He said, Dubovitsky has nothing to do with Tatarnova, and everybody who knows anything about Tatarnova knows he has nothing to do with it. The accusations are absurd. All of this comes back to Filaret, and this is where I need to quote. Uh, he addresses Filaret specifically in the letter, which suggests he knew who was behind the, in the investigation, because this is the third section investigation, but he addresses his statement to Filaret on the assumption that that's who's behind it, and he's ultimately reading these documents. Uh, so he says this uh, about the Radenia, uh, is your first material lie. And he said, it's, he's already in the previous sentence addressed Filaret. So he's talking to Filaret, your first material lie. And then Dubovitsky never belonged, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then he continues, why isn't it permitted to compose religious songs? Mad convulsions and foaming at the mouth are a devilry that can only take place in Filaret's office. Was it the devil himself that made him come up with such nonsense? So according to your opinion, Dubovitsky must also have this devilry superstitions and nonsense that exist among chatty village women. Uh, so he accuses Filaret of having a nasty imagination and inventing all of this. Um, and there is no evidence that it came from anywhere but Filaret's imagination, to be honest. Um, and also, of course, makes the absolute worst accusation you can to a powerful man, which is to say that he sounds like a chatty village woman, God forbid. Um, but that also alludes to the fact that all of the charges are basically gossip. The entire investigation is based on gossip and rumors, and the informants and denunciations, of course, are also gossip and rumors. Um, so that's a whole other kind of aspect of this that, that I'll be focusing on the book, but not so much here. So in any case, uh, kind of wrapping up this part of it, um, I want to uh, get to this issue of Filaret, and also I have to thank Nikos, who's here today, for just giving me by text just earlier today. The perfect name for everything I'm describing here is the Filaret of Sheena. I love that, and I'm going to use that. It's great. Um, Dubovitsky himself and this uh, Ivan Pavlov very clearly, very explicitly say Filaret's behind all of this. Who is Filaret? This is Filaret Trozdov, who's the Moscow Metropolitan. I don't know if you can see my Zoom controls are over his dates there. Um, uh, there we go, 1821 to 1867. Filaret is uh, known, he's famous, and larger, more, uh, more for the later part of his, uh, uh, of his tenure, uh, and particularly under Alexander II, um, and, then, uh, uh, and, and the foreign policy and all those things in which he was sticking his nose and so on. There is one book written about Filaret and foreign policy in the later period. There absolutely needs to be a biography. If anyone's looking for a project, write a biography of Filaret. His life is absolutely amazing and he was involved in everything. Um, in any case, Dubovitsky started his defense uh, in 1833 when he's going into the monastery by saying this whole thing ultimately comes down to disagreement between 
uh, Philaret, uh, who had not that long ago in 1821 become Mesco Moscow Metropolitan, and the guy he replaced, who is now the Petersburg Metropolitan, Serafim Glagolevsky. Um, so Seraf Serafim is in Petersburg. Serafim initially defended Dubovitsky. Serafim got him out of the monastery after only two years after the first charge, uh, and only later steps out of the process and refuses to make any further statements regarding Dubovitsky. So he never does turn against Dubovitsky, but Dubovitsky's accusation is that Filaret forced Serafim out of the discussion and that Serafim was his staunch supporter um, until kind of pushed out of the issue by Filaret. Um, the other interesting thing we know um, is that there's a letter from Dubovitsky to this Archimandrite Platon, who I couldn't find a picture of, um, who's the, the Archimandrite of the Boris and Glob Mo Monastery near Moscow. Um, this is the Platon who gave his own child to Dubovitsky to educate, uh, which was you know, potentially the school that was violating his, uh, his uh, agreement when he left the monastery. Um, that Platon, uh, there's a letter in the file between uh, a correspondence between Dubovitsky and Platon where both of them are discussing Radenia as merely an interesting practice that neither of them engaged in, but with that was perfectly fine. Um, so it's in the third section file as evidence that Dubovitsky did not disapprove of Radenia, and they make that the link to Tatarnova, even though they couldn't prove anything else. There is no other link. Um, he didn't oppose Radenia, is, is the crime. Um, but neither did Platon, and neither did Serafim the last time he commented on it, which is only in the 1820s. In other words, Radenia was not necessarily heretical. It was not necessarily a false teaching. Um, this had not really been decided yet by the church until Metropolitan Filaret makes an issue out of it with, with this case and the case against the Taranova as well. Um, and then it, everyone else stops talking about it after that. All of the other clerics stop taking positions on it. Um, so Filaret does seem to be behind the entire persecution of Dubovitsky. He seems to be behind the, uh, the exaggeration of whatever Radenia was and making it into something uh, considered more and more officially as heretical. Um, why was Filaret doing this? Um, that, you know, there's a million reasons. And, and in the earlier version of this in the paper, I went through a number of sort of possible suppositions. Um, but what I want to talk about now is, is the new information that I got from the Petersburg archives. Um, oh, well, before I get into that, actually, I have to give you one more quote. This is a great quote. It's from another Galitzin. There's like 50 Galitzins involved in this case, and I tried to get rid of most of them. Um, one of the people who, who helped to continue the interest of the third section into putting resources into this case was actually the Moscow Governor General, D.V. Galitzin, who seems to have been tied to Filaret, um, but a completely different Galitzin. Uh, who was working for the Moscow military governor general, but just as a lower level official, he was actually one of the people who physically searched Dubovitsky's home several times. So this lower level, Colonel Prince Galitsyn, uh, said that Dubovitsky's home in 1833 resembled one of the best monasteries, that he was an incredibly faithful and modest person living a pious life. And he also uh, concluded his report saying, Spiritual authorities suspect Dubovitsky because civil authorities do, and civil authorities suspect him because spiritual authorities previously suspected him, which seems like a pretty plausible explanation of the whole thing, except for the sheer amount of, of time and attention and resources that go into this. It must be more than that. Um, so some new information from the archives. Uh, the first thing is the Ministry of Finance, which surprised the heck out of me. Um, I was simply going through the card catalog for any mentions of Tatarnova, and that's how I found myself in the Ministry of Finance archive, where I did not expect to maybe ever be in my career. It turns out the Ministry of Finance, in addition, like I said, to the third section, the Synod, um, and uh, the Ministry of Enlightenment, all put about 20 years worth of time and effort into paying attention to what Tatarnova was up to and anyone connected with her or purported to be connected with her. The Ministry of Finance was following not only Tatarnova, but a number of other sects. They, their concern seems to have been that they believed Tatarnova's circle in particular because it was so high level, so highly connected. The social circles involved were very elite people, including, of course, Alexander I, the, the painter of Borovikovsky, Alexander Nikolaevich Galitsyn, Minister of Enlightenment himself, um, and others of a sort of similar social significance, that there had to be a lot of money involved was the concern of the Ministry of Finance, that they, these people had to have been fundraising 
and there had to be huge amounts of money being more or less hidden within this circle. Um, they also thought similar things though of other, other sectarian groups, which were much less elevated in, in social composition and almost certainly couldn't have had money of any you know, important scale. But Tatarnova's circle also, as it turns out, had no money. Uh, there was a dacha outside of Petersburg where they met and that's the only known property associated with them and it was simply borrowed. Um, so there is no, after years and years and years and years of investigation, they find nothing at the bottom of it. Similarly, Dubovitsky does not actually seem to have been guilty of anything. And Tatarnova, as far as we know, um, and I, by the way, now seen, they have in Irgia, uh everything that was seized by the police at the moment of Tatarnova's arrest was put into a file. And there's one file with all of it. So it has her books, it has her letters, uh, it's got a list of the contents of her house at the time that they searched it. Um, everything, including all these songs. And there's lots and lots of notebooks of songs. Um, there are some foreign books about religion and a couple of them are, are mystical or even maybe a cult. Again, I need to look at them much more closely. I've just, just taken a quick look so far. Um, so you can see the interest of the police in this, um, but the songs are, are, like I said, just songs. There's no evidence of, of foaming at the mouth and so on. That was only ever said by accusers. And it seems those accusations do seem to trace back to Fillerette. Um, so it doesn't look like, in other words, there's anything to any of this. And of course, the connection to politics, the timing of 1825, 1830, 1848 being significant years in the investigations and when arrests tend to occur right around those dates, same thing with the Tarnava, same with some of the others involved. Obvious conclusion is that they are concerned about political sedition, except that Tatarnova herself and all of the people following her are ultra conservative nationalists. They all are. Um, and the more I read Tatarnova's papers, the more clear that becomes. Uh, how on earth can this be connected to anything political? I found the origin point of that, and you could have knocked me over with a feather in the little room at Ergia when I came across this. Um, there is a, I think it's 12 volumes, a huge number of volumes of papers of uh, uh, Archimandrite Foti of the Yuryev Monastery outside Novgorod, um, which I was able to go to. That was really fun. Um, but anyway, Foti, you may have heard of because of Pushkin. Pushkin wrote a scurrilous epigram accusing Foti of having an affair with Anna Orlova, who's the daughter of the Orlov who supposedly regicide, right? So she's Anna Orlova Chesminska, that one. She was vastly wealthy. She never married. She has a gorgeous estate, by the way, outside of Novgorod that's being restored right now to be turned into a museum. You can't get into it yet. Um, it's all barricaded up with scaffolding, but they are working on that right now. She was a, a patron of Archimandrite Foti of the nearby Yuri of Monastery. She gave lots and lots of money to the monastery. That's as far as we know the full reality. Pushkin accused them of having an affair and of Foti of essentially being a dirty old man. Um, what we know from Foti's five, five, oh, sorry, private papers, which are, you know, just he kept everything he did when he was at the monastery over decades. Um, in those papers, there is a, his hand copy of the letter he wrote to uh, Tsar Alexander I. Um, and this was, uh, sorry, the date should be on here. Uh, didn't put the footnote separately from here, but I think it was um, 1823. Um, but he wrote to Alexander I, uh, specifically, he says right at the beginning, to call attention to the problem of women. Um, I was thinking that I would you know, infer and argue that the, their discomfort with a lot of this is the fact that there are women involved. Foti just says right out, it's women. You, Zar, you've got to know there's women here that are a problem. <laughs> it's almost that direct, it's crazy. Um, that specifically among sectarians, there are highly placed women. And he says explicitly, all such groups are political in nature. And he says that they are political in nature by definition, any groups. And he's, the reasoning is unclear. It seems to be because they're women. It's almost as if he's saying that. Um, and he directly links it to Jacobinism. He says they're essentially all Jacobins uh, and refers to the recent European wars. And then further, Fodi volunteers that, quote, with the help of only 12 good men of the police, the threat could be liquidated. And that seems to be the origin of the investigation, which starts with Dubovitsky, it starts with Arakcheyev in 1824. So before Nicholas, before the third section, Arakcheyev is sent off to do this. Um, and the, this, this letter to the Tsar comes right before, uh, within about six months before Arakcheyev's arrest of Dubovitsky. 
So Tarnava is only under surveillance at this period until later when the third section, her first arrest comes under the third section and later, um, but she is put under surveillance. All of them are put under surveillance at this time. Um, and the other really interesting thing about it um, is that the beginning of the letter has this, the, you know, the very formulaic, the way you address the emperor, right? It's, it's a whole lot of uh, formal rhetoric at the beginning. And then because Foti is a cleric, he, he sort of goes out about his lifetime of service and piety um, to, you know, have, have the, to justify even writing to the czar on anything. He explains all of the, you know, his lifetime uh, of modesty and piety and all of that. And then finally says uh, uh, that it is the unfortunate moral laxity towards these women so far that have given them their influence. Whose moral laxity so far has made these women influential? Alexander I, of course. Uh, and Alexander already knew this. And by, by the 1820s, was, uh, I mean, according to Andrei Zorin, and I, I'm completely convinced by it, uh, Alexander kind of gave up on Baroness Krudner and all these mystics almost as soon as, as it was right around the time of the Holy Alliance, of course, he became interested in them. And then he more or less got over it almost immediately. Um, so he's already no longer personally involved with these people, although his sister, uh, Grand Duchess Catherine, still is uh, involved with them or is corresponding with them. Um, but it seems that Foti specifically accuses Alexander I of causing the problem and that and specifically calling it a political threat and specifically calling it a political threat because there's women involved. Um, from That's the extent of what Foti says in the letter. Beyond that, we know a few things. One of which is that there was a rumor going around at the time, a well-known rumor, many of his biographers have mentioned it, that Alexander had an affair with the Tarnava. Who knows, probably not. Most of those rumors are, are unfounded, um, but Foti would certainly have heard uh, the rumors, and so he might have been thinking there was a great deal more moral laxity than, than probably was actually the case. Um, but also, uh, in addition to Foti's letter, the third section surveillance documents of the Tarnava and everybody else, starting in, in 1824 and beyond, there is tremendous interest every time they're talking about any of these women, and it also includes um, Zinaida Balkonska is mentioned, Anna Labzina is mentioned, um, but also Grand Duchess Catherine, um, they don't mention her directly, but sort of, you know, into the imperial family kinds of connections. Um, and uh, Alexandra Sturza, whose brother was the, the very important diplomat, Alexander Sturza, um, and uh, Sofia Svechna. Uh, all of these women, when they're talked about, the question that the officials ask is who are they connected to? Which men are they connected to? Who are their brothers, husbands, fathers, associates? And this, I think, is the connection to Dubovitsky. Why Dubovitsky is so interesting to them. They seem to believe there was a real connection. I don't think there actually was one. But the point for them seems to have been that these women are painting the men who are in service to the Tsar. So it's not the women themselves, um, but they're influencing men who should be serving the Tsar. And what goes unspoken is Alexander Nikolaevich Golitsyn, incredibly powerful uh, and important person. Let me, um, sorry. I'm just going to show the screen to go back to his titles, but I'll just quote him again. So he's Oberprocuror, Ober -procuror, that's hard to say with American R's, of the Holy Synod from 1803 to 1817, and then 1816 to 1824, he's Minister of Enlightenment. And then, interestingly, 1824 is when he's, he is replaced as Minister of Enlightenment, and he follows postal and he, he, re he remains chief of the postal department until he retires and then dies in the 1840s. Um, so it seems like he was demoted in some way, not demoted, chief of the post department is still a very important position. And of course, overseeing the content of the mail was a very important moral position. So it's not, I don't think generally understood that, that there was anything sort of wrong with Galitsyn's career, but he went from founding the Bible Society and being an open supporter of Tatarnova to after 1824, not speaking on these topics whatsoever. Just not, not another word about it. He doesn't actively go after these people the way the third section is doing and Benkendorf is doing as head of the third section uh, in the later period, but he's, he's also not um, defending anyone openly anymore. So he remains more or less in power, whether he's kind of effectively demoted or not. And then there's Spillaret. How does Spillaret get into this? One of the interesting things I found in the archives is Spillaret's diary, which is there and is mostly incredibly boring as most diaries of the period are, uh, but, uh, some of the mentions in there are every single time he meets with a member of the imperial family, and it is 
Nicholas, the future Tsar Nicholas I, his wife and his children, and he meets with them very regularly. They're all patrons of his uh, monastery in Moscow. They're patrons of a particular church he was working on. I haven't pursued the details of that yet. Um, but he meets with them as spiritual advisor. Uh, that's mentioned several times. He seems to be bragging to his own diary about his connections. Uh, is honestly how it came across. Maybe that's just my reading of it. But in any case, he clearly had a close personal uh, relationship with Nicholas and his entire family, particularly the wife, um, Alexandra. So uh, that's from the point where Alexander is still Tsar uh, in 1823 and 1824. And then, of course, after Nicholas takes power, the December's Rebellion, the Third Section is formed, and then all of these arrests very quickly uh, heat up, and Philaret is, is identified as the person behind them. And he is elevated into greater and greater heights of power ever after that. Uh, until he's playing a key role in foreign policy by the 1860s. Um, so it looks like Foti, who is a bit of a character, <laughs> starts this um, and suggests some very scary things in his letter to Alexander I, which Alexander I must have done something about because otherwise we wouldn't see the surveillance begin right away. We probably wouldn't see Arakcheyev traveling around to Rizan um, looking for heretics. Uh, and then, and other provinces also, of course, that's just the Dubovitsky's province is Rizan. Um, we wouldn't have seen all of that if Alexander wasn't already acting on it, but it also appears, and this is where I want to pursue next, is that Nicholas, even before he's Tsar, and of course, Nicholas very famously never wanted to be Tsar and, and uh, you know, wasn't open that he was heir to the throne and so on. What looks like it's happening behind the scenes is that Philaret and Alexander Nikolaevich Golitsyn, two very important people in the establishment at the time, are turning to Nicholas knowing he's the future before Alexander even dies. And of course, Alexander's death was surprising and early, so it's odd. Um, but they're, they're, Philaret and Alexander Nikolaevich Golitsyn are clearly in their uh, statements and then with Golitsyn, the, the cessation of statements. Uh, about Kaparnova particularly and then, and then folding up the Bible society are repositioning cells the way the wind is going. And the way they perceive the wind to be going is where Nicholas is, is, is setting things. And that's happening already before Alexander is dead, which I found surprising and interesting. So I'm gonna pursue it from there. And that's my presentation. I really look forward to hearing what you all have to say about it. Kate, thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. Um, let's turn to uh, Marta Gashevich for some comments. Uh, okay, I would like to thank uh, Kate Antonova for her very interesting and uh, thought-provoking uh, paper. And I think that uh, Alexander Dubovitsky's case is just a starting point for exploring at least three interconnected uh, issues. Uh, first of them is uh, complicated, very complicated relationships between the state and the church, as well as those relationships inside the church and existence of different and changing factions within the church and various uh, and changing strategies adopted by church, church hierarchs when dealing with ecclesiastical, uh, ecclesiosocial and political questions. The second one will be oppressions against uh, religious dissenters and sectarians in the Russian Empire uh, and their persecutions performed both by the church and the state. And the third one, and perhaps the most, uh, uh, the most interesting one, is female uh, religious leadership and the role of women in propagating and conserving religion and how it was perceived and treated by men in different historical circumstances. And as for the first one, uh, when uh, the case of Dubovitsky very clearly demonstrates the fatal entanglement uh, of the church and state affairs, uh, which leads to rivalization and even open struggle between hierarchs inside the church. On the one hand, of course, this phenomenon was present in church history almost from its beginning when theological debates divided its members into opposite groups. On the other hand, uh, in the Constantine uh, era of Christianity, in particular in the Russian Empire, the church hierarchs participated also in political games and intrigues, uh, striving sometimes for personal benefits, but also trying to realize this or that vision of ecclesiastical life. It is important to realize the extremely complicated nature of divisions and alliances, both inside the church 
and between the particular ecclesiastical and secular representatives. For example, Metropolitan Spilaret and Serafim used to participate together in works of Bible society in Russia in the early uh, 20s. Uh, yet in uh, 24, uh, Serafim started to criticize uh, its Protestant spirit and ordered to withdraw from sale the catechism written by Filaret because it quoted the Bible in Russian translation. Uh, and uh, it's interesting also that he showed favoritism to Foti and helped to transfer him to Petersburg from a provincial monastery. Uh, what seems important uh, is also that the period when Dubovitsky was persecuted in uh, 1830s was exactly the time of the uh, struggle for dominance by Baza Priabladanie, as Nikolai Leskov put it, uh, when uh, some ecclesiastical authorities headed by Metropolitan Filaret, uh, 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 who supported the idea of autocracy, but he didn't agree with secular interference in church matters, uh, they tried to, uh, but in vain, uh, to free the church from the state control, at least to some extent. Uh, the result, uh, as we know, was the opposite, because when Nikolai Protasov became a chief procurator in uh, 1836, uh, uh, the church became almost completely helpless. The Holy Synod could continue to pass resolutions, but their implementation depended on the chief procurator and his special uh, chancellery. Uh, so while Filaret tried to struggle for church independence, which finally resulted in his falling out of uh, Nicholas' favor, Metropolitan Seraphim was known for his weakness and tendency to make concessions. Uh, uh, just a few remarks, because uh, this uh, issue may be continued for a long time. But uh, as for the second one, uh, and the sectarians on believers and so on, who were, of course, uh, considered a potentially subversive group, at least from the period of Peter the Great, but of course, we know that the tradition of state persecutions of religious dissenters is very long and not limited to Russian Empire or to the Orthodoxy. Yet, uh, as we know, during the reign of Nicholas I, persecutions became especially harsh, especially in comparison with the uh, era of Alexander I. And Nicholas' uh, attempt to eradicate all believers and other nonconformists may be considered a result of uh, contradictions uh, inherent in his modernized policy of official nationality. And it is presented like that in uh, Thomas uh, Marsden's book, The Crisis of Religious Tolera Toleration in Imperial uh, Russia. Uh, uh, as orthodoxy was considered uh, one of three unifying factors, the aim was to erase uh, those who split the official religion. And this understanding of old believers, sectarians, as potentially politically subversive and even revolutionary remained popular in the second half of the 19th century, when some Russian revolutionaries, such as Afanasy Shapov and Vasily Kielsev, uh, considered them to be openly anti-imperial. And this approach was then renewed at the turn of the 19th and the 20th century, when sectarians appealed to Russian symbolists because of both their mystical experiences and their secret ceremonies and uh, their illegal status and disloyal reputation. Oh, this, this issue may be also continued for a long time, but we don't have so much time. So I proceed to the third one, uh, the most interesting, uh, the phenomenon of female religious leadership and strong male opposition. Mm, uh, yeah, although uh, this phenomenon uh, seems to be especially popular in the first quarter of the 19th century, uh, of course, it does not limit itself to that period. And we can mention that uh, in the, uh, among sectarians, uh, 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 and so on, uh, 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 female uh, uh, leadership was quite often. There were uh, several Bagarodice, uh, mothers of God, who were leaders of uh, their uh, communities. Uh, so so uh, this phenomenon was known already in the uh, um, 18th century, but it also uh, continued in the second half of the 19th century, and not only among sectarians, uh, uh, let's say from the lower uh, part of the society, but also from those from the uh, highers, higher parts, such as uh, I can uh, 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 tell about uh, some of them. Uh, so one of them was Yulia Zasietskaya, uh, who was the daughter of the famous uh, Denise Davidov, 
soldier and poet of the Napoleonic War, uh, he was, uh, she, uh, Julia Zasiecka was famous for establishing the first shelter for the homeless in Petersburg. And he was one of the few who had enough courage to openly profess Protestant faith and propagate the teachings of Lord Redstock uh, among uh, uh, Peter, St. Petersburg's aristocracy. Uh, another interesting uh, person, uh, but this time uh, of, uh, mm, uh, from the orthodox and clearly orthodox uh, uh, mm, part of the uh, society was Grand Duchess uh, Elizaveta Fyodorovna, who, who is now the, the saint. Uh, and we know that after her husband uh, was killed, was assassinated uh, in uh, 1905, uh, he, she founded the Marfa Mariinsky convent, uh, who was uh, dedicated to helping the downtrodden of Moscow. Uh, she is now venerated as a saint, canonized in uh, uh, 1992. But at the beginning of her activity, some members of the Holy Synod were very skeptical about her convent and suspected her of being inspired by Protestantism and the wish to reintroduce the deaconesses and propagating Western values. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, the situation changed and the women uh, seem, uh, uh, seemed to be uh, accepted uh, to some extent as religious leaders, especially in the, uh, among symbolists, because we know that there were several uh, female mystics at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, such as Zinaida Gipius, Anna Minslova, and the most uh, famous of them, uh, uh, Helena Blavatskaya. Uh, Helena Blavatsky, the leading theoretician of theosophy. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, then the situation uh, uh, changes a little bit, but uh, uh, traditionally, uh, and, and, and uh, especially in the church, women were accepted and welcome as religious followers, not religious leaders. Uh, and even when they belong to the Orthodox Church, their activity may seem suspicious, uh, as in the case of Elizaveta Fyodorovna, or at least regarded as frivolous, ungrounded, uh, or not serious. Uh, Leskov, for example, called uh, their uh, piety salonne blagachestie, uh, yes, with such a smile. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, when they were leaders of any sectarian movement, they become double uh, untrustworthy. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this very interesting uh, um, speech. And uh, yes, uh, just a few observations. Marta, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll give Kate a, a chance to respond a bit in case you want to do that, Kate. And then we'll open up the floor to questions. Um, with the reminder that Sasha, who usually moderates the discussion, keeps track of questions in this chat. Sasha is not here today, so I'll be doing that on my own. And um, for that reason, you can feel free to um, to hit me up in the chat if I miss anything. So, Kate, let's let's hear from you. I primarily just want to thank Marta for those comments, and also I'm really happy to talk as much as people want to in the Q&A about the kind of broader context. I should also mention um, Patrick Lally Michelson, whose uh, book on the, the, how does he call it, the aesthetic revolution in orthodoxy, which is um, kind of starting a little bit after what I'm talking about and going into the, the turn of the 20th century. And uh, he had a panel, uh, uh, did a paper on that at ACs a few years ago. And I asked him if he saw it as gendered in any way. And he said he hadn't actually thought about it in those terms, but it struck me that the language was incredibly gendered and that the asceticism he was seeing as being kind of, I don't know if enforced is the word he would use, but, but is definitely becoming more and more um, uh, uh, the, the dominant mode um, in approved orthodoxy um, is more and more masculine is the way I would put it, that the characteristics he defines under asceticism from my reading as a gender historian, have a very specifically masculine cast. And I think what I'm talking about fits right in with what he's saying. I also have to say in the fastest wish fulfillment I have ever encountered in academia, the biography of Filaret that I've been desperately wanting has been written <laughs> by Nicholas Raciotis. Is that, is that correct pronunciation? Um, in 2018. So I have missed that to this day because I was uh, in the archives and then in the pandemic. Um, and I can't wait to go read it, um, but he's here in the, in the Zoom and, and has, I'm gonna 
uh, re put this in the chat for everyone. He sent me the title. Um, and I cannot wait to read that, obviously, and hear any comments he might want to share with us today. Thank you very much, Kate. So, um, and thanks for the for the reference in the in the chat too. So the floor is open. I think that probably the best way to do it would be to indicate to me in the chat, either put your question in the chat for me to read, or just type I have a question. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Catherine, and uh, for the for the presentation and Marta for those comments to follow up. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I don't, um, I don't know anything about this topic, really, but I, I do find it fascinating. Um, I want to say that what, what pulls me in um, is actually a very small detail from the end of um, Ivan Turgenev's King Lear the Steps, that I had re had I previously been trying to figure out for myself, like, what was the import of it, uh, that one of um, Martin Petrovich's daughters becomes a, a um, um, uh, the head of a sect. Like this is just like the end of her story <laughs> in, in that short story. And her sister also became this very, um, she became a leader of a different type. She sort of became a, the head of the state there and was sort of a default public, uh, I guess, a in public leadership there and I was just I was just I always try to make sense of what what was the import of her becoming um the head of this sect her own sect um I think he says she's he describes her as sort of uh, with a surfeit of authority like she's very um and so I guess from a political theory or a science point of view I was not I guess I was not surprised when you said that this became a very explicit uh, commentary about Alexander the First. That this is very political, and there are women in leadership, and this is a. It's always political when these women are heads of sex. Um, but I guess my question would be: I, I, What surprises me about that is, in my <laughs> very simple layperson uh, thinking about uh, Russian Orthodoxy amongst world religions. I always, as a lay person, just thought it was interesting that um, the mother, that Mary is so central um, as opposed to other, um, I guess, uh, other Christianities that, you know, usually center Christ or, I mean, even sometimes just Christ and the Father. Uh, but Mary seems so central uh, to, to Orthodoxy. So what what are your thoughts on you know, why, why at this time, why in the 19th century, are, you know, is the aesthetic becoming masculine? Why, why is, I mean, what explains this sort of, you have like Mary as central iconography in this very powerful institution. Uh, you've had empresses of Russia. Um, what, what is happening here? I guess that's such an interesting puzzle to me. Like, what are your thoughts on why this, why is this happening? Um, well, I'm also just an ordinary lay person and totally dependent on being corrected by Nikos and Nadia and all the other real religious historians. <laughs> um, and on Marianism and Mary, of course, Vera Shevsov is, is our expert. Um, and she wrote a whole book on Marianism in the later period. So we see Marianism as, as this really interesting and important thing later. Um, but it's obviously to just uh, kind of talk about it in the context of, of the specific period that I'm working on. Um, the issue, to the extent it was theological, it was about what they did, uh, at least with Tatarin about what she supposedly did, the foaming at the mouth, which again, I have no evidence, there's no suggestion anywhere that it was this reputation she had, which is just taken for granted pretty much ever since of doing things like foaming at the mouth, but it all comes from Fillerette. It, there doesn't appear to be any contemporary, contemporaneous statement that she did anything other than sing songs. And now that I've seen her files, she read some weird stuff. She read widely, I'm sure a lot of people did, but the songs are the plainest, most frankly boring little tunes you've ever seen. She described it simply as Vastorg, feeling joy in God. Um, and there is nothing in her writings that suggests it was ever anything more than that. Um, and the only influences I see there are, are Protestant, maybe, and I don't know if that's direct or, or just coincidental or whatever, I got to read Andrei Ivanov and I've talked to him, 
Um, but what we do see, obviously, with women as, as social leaders and having influence over people's minds is the Enlightenment Salonier, right? The, the Enlightenment Salon leaders, which was very, very political. You know, it plays a role in the French Revolution, for goodness sake. So it makes sense that someone like, like Nicholas I and the later Alexander I associate women, leading salons, political, elite men involved, their ideas get twisted, Jacobinism, boof, right? It, that seems clear and obvious. It's just Tatarnova was not that. She was not remotely that. She was deeply, deeply conservative, extremely modest. Just like Dubovitsky, the man lived like a monk in or out of the monastery his whole freaking life. And in his own defense, which is actually a very powerful defense, never did anything wrong a day in his life. And he's just persecuted for so many years. Um, so th it seems like they chose exactly the wrong people. And to me, it seems like their, their fear of sedition is, is, you know, is very much taking over the facts. Um, but obviously, symbolically, the women as social leaders. And then I wonder if in the Russian context, it's particularly related to uh, the idea of women as pure and therefore having a role as intercessor, which is Isolde Thyret. You know, she's talking about Muscovy, of course, but, but her very influential book on women, Orthodox women as intercessors, that's much earlier, that's hundreds of years earlier. But the, the fear of women uh, in leadership positions in a case like Tatarnova or, for example, for example Raksandr Sturza, uh, who is just primarily doing charity. Um, I like a lot of the women, actually, that, that Marta just mentioned as well. They were doing good work. And most of them, I mean, there are cases like uh, Lokonska, who's a Catholic convert. Um, there, there are people who are you know, actually sectarians and or converts to other faiths. Obviously, there's an issue there, but part of a professed to be a good Orthodox believer, just a really enthusiastic one. <laughs> That's it, right? Dubovitsky also. Um, and some of these other women were simply doing a lot of charity. Uh, so they were just effective at it. And the concern may have been that looks like a, a French salon leader, although it, it's, <laughs> it doesn't look that much like it to me. It's simply an association between women uh, as 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 hosts and, and therefore having effect on ideas and, and doing a different context. I think maybe that piece of, of sort of Muscovite sense of intercessor, because of course orthodoxy, unlike Catholicism, you know, doesn't have the priest as intercessor and you're not supposed to be Bible reading and, and, and you know, writing your own songs. Uh, so that is, I, I do get where that's suspicious, <laughs> um, except that, you know, she wasn't using that to get anywhere anti-orthodox or, or anywhere pushing orthodox boundaries in any way, uh, but that's what they feared, right? That it looks, it looks Protestant, that could look um, both heretical and political very easily, but I think Nikos is dying to jump in here, and he is the actual expert, or Nadia too, of course, Eugene Clay is here as well. There's a bunch of people who know like 10 times more than I do who should just jump in. <laughs> Well, Katya, that's very generous of you. Yes, the next question Chad, is from Nicholas Chrysidis. And I'll let you say it yourself. Okay. Um, hi, uh, Katya. Um, great to see everyone. Katya, great talk. I'm going to be very um, brief. <laughs> um, it seems to me one of the lines that you may want to look into is the issue of how many of the people who are involved here are archimandrites. And the reason I'm saying mm. this is the following. I don't need to tell the August company here that Greek, I mean, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Orthodox clergymen in general are very insecure when women are doing anything outside of their control, real or imagined. It is especially so it seems to me impressionistically speaking among the, the attitude is among argument rights even worse why because you have unmarried men who are waiting in line to get into positions of authority in the church all the people that i am aware of in the 19th century from antonin capusti all the way back who complain about women are argument rights when they become bishop, they seem to be a little bit less worried about it. Now, again, this is totally impressionistic. So it may be political, it may be social, it may be, but it seems to me in orthodoxy, we have a big problem. It's called Cerse les Archimandrites. 
as Nadia would put it, in better <laughs> French than mine. Thank you. That's 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 what I wanted to say. It's not actually a question. It's just a friendly suggestion here. <laughs> Oh, no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and also, it reminded me there was something I saw. Um, part of Tatarnova's file is they have regular reports about her behavior after she's been confined in the monastery. Um, and uh, she is reported to have good behavior uh, ever after that. Um, but there were um, other reports about others um, who are not so social elite, but some of the other sectarian groups, they're Skopti and old believers. And um, there's the, the files on sectarians in general is just feels like half of the other, yeah. Um, but there's a ton, and there I found several where where uh, there were sets of reports on women confined to monasteries, and they were deeply concerned about how they behaved in the monastery also. And it was the minutia of their concerns was frankly batshit. <laughs> it's just these dudes, these somehow, and I did not think to 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 think about their rank and, and whether it's more archimandrites. I will totally look that up. Thank you. I will find out because that's really interesting. Great, thank you. The next question we have in the chat is from JIPO5326. I'm not sure that who that is, but the question is, was it common in early 19th century Russia to imprison people in monasteries rather than prisons when they were suspected of subversive political activity? When did this become less common? Oh, I'm sure there's other people who know much more details than me about this. Um, the, the issue, I think, with, with Dubovitsky and Tarnov and all of their circles is their, they certainly assumed political content was there, but the charges were sometimes a downright about sectarianism and, and always at least partially related to something religious. So it, it made sense for these people to, to go into convents. Um, strictly political crimes with no religious content whatsoever, I don't believe in this in the 19th century, anyone was going to monasteries um, for strictly political things, but somebody correct me, others would know better. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Nadia said in the chat that Joy Demoskov has a monograph coming out about monastic incarceration. Yay. Great, thank you. And also not Christmas has our next question. Thank you. Yeah, um, so Joy Demoskov, this is to Jaipo 5362 has been working on this for a long time, so look out for that. Um, Kate, I want like I was really hoping that there would be more about masculinization in this brilliant talk. So yeah. I, I want to invite you and beg you to push <laughs> that a little bit further, because when I think about masculinization, like all of us, we see you know, immediately the images of Alexander the first versus Nicholas the first, you know, kind of airy fairy masons, <laughs> mystical circles, blah, 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 versus, you know, butch, orthodox, autocracy, <laughs> nationality. So, but like, my question is, Philadelphia really is the missing link. I think Nikos, the genius, is right that being an archimandrite is like being between an assistant and an associate professor. And being a bishop is basically like, like getting full. Like, that's it. You're secure. You have nothing more to worry about. You can afford to be generous in a way that you <laughs> earlier. But, um, but, but the thing is, though, that Fotsi did have a really bizarre relationship with Anna Arulova. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, like, there's no question there. But um, can you like somehow theorize filariat and masculinization and that specifically? Because you're right, mm -hmm. in his diary, in his correspondence, he is absolutely proud of all of the women that he has a correspondence with and that he advises. And in his mm -hmm. letters to them, he's a great guy. I mean, like that, that has to be said. There's a reason that they keep writing to him. But at the same time, he is he is somehow behind this and he's already a bishop. So we can't even give mm -hmm. him the, the Archimandrite pass. So um, mm -hmm. like where where do you see this in the broad context of early 19th century religious culture writ large? And do you see mm -hmm. the specter of muscular Christianity somewhere in the distance or are we talking <laughs> about something else altogether? I think. Uh... To me, and I'm obviously you know Patrick Michelson's book, um, and to me it reads as so incredibly masculine where things are heading that it, it's just unquestionable to me. Even though he was like, oh, I haven't thought of it that way. Um, but the the aesthetic asceticism of that, the the um, strict control over the self, um, and that to me reads as Victorian masculine, and it's patriarchal Victorianism where of course you're nice to women 
as long as they stay in their place, right? You can be a wonderful father. You can be a very involved father. That's the Victorian ideal father, right? But it's because his place is so secure and under so much tight control and a, a certain cultural aspect to it, which is what Michelson sees as the aestheticism. Now, he's seeing all of that a little bit later, but very closely later. Um, I'm thinking that Foti and then Fillerette are kind of the transition period. And this is where, where I want to go, but I'm not fully there yet because I haven't read everything yet. But I, Foti is in his own case because he is one weird nut. Um, he is just incredibly odd in every way. His relationship with Chizminska is incredibly odd. I'm just really, really hoping because I, I went to the monastery and I asked them to talk to anyone who would know anything about their archives, anything about Foti. And they said, oh, we have a great guy for that. He's not here. <laughs> so, and we had, we'd come and gone spontaneously. I hadn't found those Foti documents until like two weeks before we went to Novgorod. So I didn't know. So uh, now having thought I was done with my archival research, I want to go back, but especially if Orloa Chesminska's estate is opened, uh, it could take them 20 years. I don't know. But if, if they actually follow through on all this, then I can plan ahead and contact people ahead of time. And I'm hoping I might actually, there might be a lot more to find out about Foti and Orlova Chesminska and about that monastery and what was going on there um, beyond what Foti's own papers record, which is already pretty wild. Um, and there were all these rumors around them at the time. So Foti to me seems very much of the Alexandrian period where everyone's just nuts. <laughs> I mean, they're just all over the place. And I think that very uh, lack of control, um, the imaginativeness, the, the you know, several, like Platon, Archimandre Platon saying, what's wrong with songs? This, this Ivan Pavlov guy, whoever the hell he was, and what's wrong with songs? Um, well, isn't that what Protestants do? I mean, <laughs> it seems like there's a lot wrong with songs. Isn't that obvious? But it wasn't obvious to them at the time. They're not seeing any problem with it. And then it's Fillerette who he just exaggerates it. He doesn't say, these are songs, this sounds like a Protestant practice, which he could have, right? Wouldn't that have been a devastating critique? And it would have been reality-based um, if that was kind of where he was headed theologically. Um, and I guess that was sort of what I expected. Instead, he exaggerates it into this very crazy sounding, foaming at the mouth, rolling around on the floor, which subsequently people have kind of taken for granted to Tarnava probably did. Maybe she did, but I see no other evidence, none, anywhere. It all starts with Fillerette's statement in the third section file, which then, you know, was quoted in some of the, um, uh, Eugene Clay mentioned in the chat, um, this uh, Dubrovin guy, um, Tatarva has been written about on and off. Um, and it's usually the story as written is that she was sometimes speaking in tongues. Sometimes they say foaming at the mouth, definitely spinning around is always described. It's always given this, this clearly nutty, interpretation that I believe originates entirely in Fillerette. And something that extreme sounds to me, sounds foreign. It's very much not in control. And it sounds like the, the exactly the problem everyone had with Alexander the first in his earlier period when he's, he's toying around with Baroness Krudener and the Holy Alliance and all of that period where of course Grand Duchess Catherine was is criticized and gossiped about endlessly. Um, apparently her worst sin was, was you know, being a romantic girl, um, but she is she's just derided every time she's ever mentioned by any contemporary source, much less later, as ridiculous and in, in all kinds of ways. Um, that what I'm seeing to me, is, it looks like a Victorian change, but of course, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, of um, culture and politics, a desire for control and a desire to restore order, which is essentially reactionary. And, you know, Catherine the Great does that at the end of her reign. So there's nothing surprising in that, except that it's becoming, taking on a xenophobia and an asceticism that uh, is obviously linked with Nicholas I. Uh, we see his own personal tastes in that and also his personal experience of hating his grandmother and, and hating the idea of female rule and all of that, which is clearly influential on him. Um, so I'm not surprised to see Nicholas II actually involved in this, even earlier than I expected him to be. Um, but where's Fillerette Vionette? Well, I think we, we need to defer here to the biographer of Fillerette who we have here because that's what I needed to do next is find out more about Fillerette in his younger years in particular, which I wasn't finding anything on. But it turns out, uh, Nicholas Sarchiotis, is he still here? He, oh yeah, he's still here, okay. Can we turn the, the platform over to him? Uh, sure, let's turn it over to, to Nicholas and then um, check in with Eugene Clay to make sure that your question was answered that you put in the chat. I think it might have been addressed. And then Christine Warabek. This, this was very interesting because it took me into an area that I didn't know about. And 
there's so much to say. Let me try to be as as quick as space. In, at this particular juncture in Philaret's career, there is a whole skein of political activity that's going on with respect to the Bible Society, with respect to the catechism, with respect to his relationship to set up the Bishop of St. Petersburg, and with respect to reports that he's getting about cult activity in the salons of St. Petersburg, where he is no longer located by the time these reports are coming about. At the same time, as he is being discredited for his activity in the Bible Society and his um, catechism by Arakcheyev and other people at court, he had also been involved with um, keeping Alexander's letters that uh, designated Nicholas as his successor. So he is very prominent at court, but subsequently his influence over Nicholas and indeed his involvement in the Holy Synod will wane. It, it was mentioned here by another participant that his relations with the women, especially um, great patrons of philanthropy in Moscow are very, very strong. He had, plays the role of confessor to some very prominent women. And he also um, is very, very close to his own mother and his own family. He takes care of her to the end of his life and intercedes in various disputes in convents, champion, championing a, a clean process of choosing the abbesses of convents. But, but to address more directly where the source of his stance on this, which I really don't know very much about, and it makes me question whether there's a false attribution here to him. I'm just not sure enough. I don't want to get into a defensive posture, but I will say this, that he was receiving reports of this cult activity in the salons of St. Petersburg at the same time as he was very prominent in the persecution of old believers and other sectarians in Russia. So it would fit with his MO, so to speak, when it came to deviations from orthodoxy as, as he perceived them. And just one final thing, um, it was delightful to hear from, from Professor PC, from Nikolaos. Um, as many of you probably know, the observation of the Theotokos, of the Bagaroditsa, is, it, it's profound. It's several times a year. And so Philaret very much is um, in this tradition of what the West sometimes calls Mariolatry. Uh, so I, I just don't know quite how to fix his um, stance on this. So I, like the rest of you, will be very interested to see where the hard evidence goes and where the consequences go of, of all of it. Kate, would you like to respond? Yeah, just a really good point about um, at the same time that I have no evidence that, you know, Tatarova was filming the mouth or anything other than what Philaret said. There's also no evidence that Philaret didn't believe what he was saying. And also the, the Nicholas I, um, they, I, I mean, I, I see no reason not to believe that they sincerely thought there was sedition here. And absolutely very, very true that all of this was coming at the same time. They were hearing about truly political salons and secret societies and old believers and, and the Gosner sect and many others. There, there are a lot of sects. And Tatarnova's, I think, was deeply disturbing because the people involved were so highly ranked um, that that set off a lot of concern. The only issue is that they never found anything there. And they looked and looked and looked for decades and never found anything there. And they never seemed to have been convinced that there actually was nothing there. Interestingly to me, it's third section agents of all people who, I don't know, I wasn't really prepared to think of as sympathetic characters, but third section agents who continually say, you know, these people seem incredibly pious. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, every single report from the lower level agent is always, this man lives like a monk. This is like one of the best monasteries. He lives a modest and, and quiet life. And, and we see some, a few similar reports about Tatarnova 
um, from people who inspected her home. Um, uh, although her books were, Tatarinova's book collection was a little iffy. Um, so that's maybe the only kind of hard evidence that, that she was uh, doing something um, that could be criticized. And the songs, of course, if you decide the songs are a problem, which you know they were deciding around this time that the songs are a problem, um, then she was admitting to those and, and they're, they're, you know, they exist. There's very hard evidence of that. Um, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that uh, Silarette or Nicholas, um, let alone Foti, were, were sort of instigating uh, uh, all these investigations in order to persecute innocent people. I think they believed absolutely that there's a real, very real threat. I think it's hilarious that Foti thought 12 good cops could take care of this. <laughs> 12 good men in the police and they could eliminate all, all Jacobin threats. That, that line just blows me away. Um, but, but I think they were very sincere. Thank you. Um, Christine Warbeck, and then we'll check in with Eugene to make sure his question was answered. Um, Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I, um, I think um, a lot of this has to put in, be put into a whole lot of context that's simply missing here. Um, and um, so I have a few remarks to make. Um, one is certainly uh, that we have a confluence of a number of things going on here where women are really quite prominent. Um, you've mentioned very correctly, women in charity. Uh, uh, Orlova uh, Chusmenskaya is not alone. Uh, there are a number of these people. She has a great deal of notoriety uh, in part because of her incredible wealth. Um, but, um, and, and I, from what I've read, I just find many of these accusations are rather scurrilous. Um, we have salon women very prominent in Petersburg and Moscow. We have uh, women uh, forming uh, religious communities uh, in incredible numbers, uh, especially after the 1830s. Uh, and there's uh, particularly around Serafina Mosarov, but um, just everywhere. So women are far more prominent perhaps than they, and visibly publicly than they have been uh, for a while. Talking about foaming of the mouth has nothing to do with Western Europe. It has to do with a phenomenon within Russia itself. It's called klikushistva. It's a way to demote uh, a particular activity. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's literature out there that can be read. Um, there are a number of other things that seem to be going on here. And so I, I think it just, uh, you know, more reading <laughs> needs to be done to be able to put uh, a lot of this uh, into context. The, um, the worry about songs is something that goes back to um, Eve Levin's work, even for the 17th century. Um, the Orthodox Church in its reformatory uh, pose, uh, and this has nothing to do with feminization, although, um, or excuse me, masculinization, although uh, some of the uh, individuals uh, um, who uh, were healers uh, who were con uh, convicted uh, or uh, suspected of witchcraft could be women, but there were a lot of men in that as well, is that incantations were attacked in the 17th century for being outside the canonical norm. Uh, and only uh, uh, prayers, even though many of these are very innocent um, uh, prayers uh, and borrowing from church language, they're not uh, liturgical. So uh, already in the 17th century, there is an attempt to place um, clerical control over popular practices. So to go to the songs, these, if, if what you say are very simple songs uh, that are not part of the um, you know, the liturgy and what is expected for a prayer, any, you know, if, if, they're, if they're not mimicking orthodox hymns and prayers that are usually sung, uh, then they can be suspect. So, you know, just uh, placing all of these things in, in their historical context will make, uh, will help to make some sense of uh, what seems to be at the moment a jumble. Thanks, Christine. I'm sure Katya would like to respond. Yes, I would. 
Um, of course, there is a larger project where this context comes into play. And yes, I'm very aware of all these women. In fact, that's the subject of the larger book. And part of what's interesting about it is that they are so widely different. Like Zinaida Valkonska, who's a Catholic convert, like Anna Labzina, who is involved in masonry. These, they're coming from totally different spheres of activity and belief systems and, and how they act on them. Um, my argument is that there are so many and then there are virtually none. Um, and they're marginalized. Obviously, they're not all arrested and put into convents. Katar, Tatarnova is a pretty extreme case. Um, and some of them actually simply died <laughs> around this time. Um, and I, I don't suspect anything about their deaths, right? They had not, died natural deaths. Um, partly, there's a kind of generational change. Um, but part of what I'm arguing in the larger book, which of course I cannot argue now, I used up my 40 minutes. Um, but the argument of the larger book is that this is incredibly so common. Uh, to the post-Napoleonic period. And yes, I, I'm, there's a larger argument about the place of the war in this also that I don't have time for right now. But, um, and then it is shut down in various ways. And that's largely through marginalization rather than actual arrest, like with Tatarnova. Um, there's kind of pushing to the margins and that can happen when something becomes, we can't talk about that anymore, or that's a little too extreme. It becomes socially, so, socially marginalized is part of the process as well. And we see that elsewhere or simply the, the uh, particular person uh, moves abroad because life has become too uncomfortable uh, like Balkonska. It's different with each case, right? And obviously I can't go into all of these cases that does not imply I'm totally unaware of them, but thank you so much. Um, also uh, the issue of, of uh, the, the songs being sort of folk culture and and uh, related to, in some cases, occult or witchcraft or so on. Tatarna has nothing to do with any of that. There's an enormous difference in social status here that is obviously at issue with the Tatarnava case. Uh, there are other sectarian, sectarian cases all over the archives um, that do involve mostly peasant members or townspeople, sometimes both. Um, there are all different kinds of belief systems, including some that are uh, what I would call folk culture, but that the authorities were concerned with, with a cult and, and so on. None of that has anything to do with the Tatarnova case. There's no hint of any of that. The songs have no relation to any of that. The songs are, in fact, um, I mean, again, I have not studied them to the degree that I need to, but they are playing Protestant style hymns. The language is extremely simple, but not in the sense of a folk language. They're effectively what look like to me, and this is what I need to confirm or deny, translations or loose rewordings of Protestant hymns. Um, and that's why I want to talk to Andre Ivanov because I suspect that might even be literally the case. Uh, Tatarva had the connections for that. She was in correspondence um, with Baroness Krudner and Sophia Svechner who traveled all over Europe and met with a lot of these traveling German preachers who there were just a lot of around this time. Um, there's Gossner, of course, who was in Russia, but there were many others who were wandering around Europe and who were in touch with Krudner and Svechner and, and Krudner and Svechner were in turn in touch with Tatarva. Um, so part of this larger project is tracking all of that, and all of that has left some traces in the archives as well, and that's part of the, the other hundreds of thousands of pages I haven't gotten to yet. Great. Thank you, Kate, very much. Eugene, you had a question earlier, and I wanted to make sure that it was addressed. Oh, uh, Hang on, Taylor. Okay, yeah. great. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you, Kate. This was a really, really interesting and uh, great talk. Appreciate it. I, I just, I was wondering. My question was all about the your assessment of the historiography, and I wondered if you wanted to say anything beyond the fact that um, you know there uh, that they you know there's there's a been neglect of the archival uh, material that you have. I, I'm I'm interested um, in some of the. Uh, well, Yuri Kandakov, maybe you know his his work because he's yeah. he comes out as a um, you know kind of real uh, champion of uh, Foti and and it's it's like you know Russia is in this uh, is suffering from spiritual insecurity at the early early nineteenth century and you know Foti is the hero who comes in and saves uh, saves Russia from. Uh, you know, uh, going down the path of spiritual degeneracy. It, it's, it's, it's a very interesting argument for, uh, especially for the early 21st century now that, that and so, um, uh, and of course the Tatarin of a circle, you know, plays an enormous role in, in Russian, um, in some of Russian literature. I'm Melnikov Pichersky, it, it's, it's, you know, he molds Tatarin of into this picture of a kind of uh, uh, the, the dark cult leader who controls the, the peasantry 
uh, and then you get uh, Dubrovin, who's who's you know is kind of responds to that in that uh, article I mentioned. That, you know the sectarians are actually they're they're pure. Their their motives were pure. You know that's the way he ends that. Mm -hmm. That's that his his assessment. So I was just wondering if you uh, might might give us your sense of how. Uh, you know, of, of the historiography, um, uh, you know, especially, I, I guess I, I'd be interested in your assessment of Kandakov. Yeah, oh, it's, things are interesting and really happening right now in, in the sort of study of, of religious conservatism, particularly, it's really popular topic among Russians today, and there's real readership for it. Um, so Kandakov, I unfortunately have not been able to meet him yet. I tried to while I was there in 2019 and thought that we would be going back the next summer. And of course, we haven't gone anywhere and I don't know when we'll get back to Russia. But I hope to be able to meet him soon. I was following his footsteps on, on most of the archival things I was reading. He was there right before me. So um, I do not have the same take that he does, nor the same interest. But I totally see where he's coming from. And he, he did do an enormous amount of archival work, which is, is very valuable because I, um, and there were things you know that I hadn't found that he found and that I, I, I found because they were in his footnotes and so on. So he's very useful. And he's writing for a Russian audience today. And part of what I think is actually interesting about this whole topic is the resonance it has uh, ever afterwards, including the rest of the 19th century and, and the 20th, and, and then maybe especially the present day, um, because Tatarnava is so easy to um, to use as a as a as a symbol of any anything you want <laughs> in many ways, um, especially because the story, as it is, is commonly known is that she was either speaking in tongues or foaming at the mouth or spinning around in circles or fainting or, or all of the above or whatever. I, I, every version varies a little bit on what exactly she was doing. Um, but because it's generally accepted as the case, you can use it. And of course, there's this long tradition in Russian history of things would not have gone down the bad path they did if only this one interesting person, right? And we could all list 20 of these people at least off the top of our heads, right? Who, if only they had had more power, if only they had lived longer, if only, you know, things had been slightly different, this really interesting person could have taken Russia down a totally different path. Um, I think that Kondakov is feeding that a little bit and, and I have nothing against that because it, it is making a lot of resources available to me <laughs> that weren't otherwise. And in fact, there's, uh, you start Googling these people, you go down some interesting rabbit holes because there are societies in Russia today that model themselves after various 19th century mystics. Um, they're pretty eclectic. I think they like all of them. And there's actually lists of mystics and so on. And that's part of where Dubovitsky always gets listed on like almost every list. <laughs> it wasn't any of these things, not, not one of them. Um, but a lot of that does seem to go back to Ruske Starina. And I didn't want to mention something really interesting about Ruske Starina. A lot of you may already be familiar, but in Pushkinsky Dom, there is a, an archive of the, the editor's archive from Ruski Starana that has like editor's notes and, and, and longer drafts and things like that, that supposedly more than what was published in, in the final issues. Um, they would not let me see any of the stuff from the years I was looking at. They said it was Restauratia, um, which I guess is the case, but they were kind of squirrely about it. It was really weird. And they all started talking to each other when I started asking for them. I don't know what that's about, but they promised that if I came back in a few years, I could probably get it. So uh, one of the things that was listed in the office at, at Pushkinsky Dom was that there were definitely more papers uh, about Tatarnova, about Foti. There, were, there was a long series of articles relating to all of these people in Ruske Starina in, in the late 19th century. And it said in the OPC that there was more stuff related to it. So I've not yet seen that, but I'm hoping there's going to be a gold mine there. Um, I don't know if Kondakov has already seen it. I should actually check that because I, I didn't go back and then look if he had already seen that stuff. Um, it's possibly he has. Um, but um, yeah, did that answer your question? I mean, Kondakov, I, I'm dying to meet because I, I think he has a very particular personal interest, um, which is not to, to uh, I don't want to undermine, I don't want to say anything against the scholarship whatsoever. Actually, the scholarship is excellent. But I think he's writing very much for present day Russian popular interest in this, which is fair enough. Um, it's just not where, where I'm coming from, but um, I think it speaks to, yes, the long-term significance of, of what's going on here. For as understudied as Tarnova has been, she's just kind of, she's always mentioned as, as a figure rather than the actual person. And what's amazing to me is there's so much of the actual person actually in the archives that were available. I mean, they've been available to Russian scholars for a very long time. I honestly only found that third section file because I was bored and just thinking around and putting in keywords 
well, waiting around, you know, at GARF. Um, I don't know how long it would have taken me to figure that out, how much was in the third section. I was, you know, waiting to get to Petersburg to look there. Um, it just never occurred to me that there would be so much in the third section archive. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the set of things that they took from her when she was arrested, you know, the, at Irgia, there's the small room for the, the special things. It's far more expensive to get copies of that stuff. And you're, uh, there's like a line to sit in that room because there's only a few seats and it, it's a huge pain to do anything in there. Foti's books and the stuff they seized when Tatarnova was arrested are both little room things. Um, and it's kind of hard to get your hands on them. Um, so it may have just been kind of too irritating to get to that stuff um, that nobody's had, you know, pursued it that far. But Kandakov did look a lot, at a lot of that. He's read that stuff. He's obviously read all the Foti stuff. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any more questions right now, and we're coming to the end of our designated time, but this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. And for me personally, as a non-historian, um, it's very exciting to see this interest in religious history and in orthodoxy and um, to let it just inform my own thinking. It's, it seems very fruitful, and um, Kate, this project just sounds fascinating. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you for thank you to the Subsidnik and thank you to everyone who participated in the discussion. We will see you in a couple of weeks with our um, for our last 19 V of 2021. Thanks a lot.